Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our uh, weekly podcast slash uh, internet radio show in which we examine uh, all things Beatles, both their history and uh, what's going on now and what may be happening in the future as well. Who knows? Uh, I'm uh, Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. First of all, out in San Francisco, the uh, the columnist for Beatles Examiner and various other Examiner columns at examiner.com, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. And all the way across the country in uh, in scenic Connecticut, uh, <laughs> the uh, the host of uh, the the syndicated uh, Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Hi, Al. How's everyone doing? And good. And uh, and back in Maine after a after a short hop down to his old stomping grounds in New York City, the our resident musicologist and longtime classical music reviewer and a contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine and etc. Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Al. Hello, hello, everyone. I thought that we would devote uh, tonight's show or this week's show to uh to kind of an, uh, a look at an aspect of the Beatles uh, career that I think uh, kind of gets overlooked and that's the influence of black music uh on the Beatles you know when uh when people uh think of the the influences on the beatles the direct musical influences they always of course talk about elvis or about carl perkins or jerry lee lewis or other you know rockabilly acts but actually their um, their musical roots have uh, have a great deal to do with uh, with early R&B and doo-wop and uh, and then uptown R&B uh so I thought we would uh, we would talk about this and uh let's uh, let's get some thoughts on this um from uh first uh, let's try Steve Marinucci <laughs> I, I had this feeling you were coming to me first. Um, <laughs> you know, a, actually, I mean, just to start this, I mean, if there's one thing that you really have to, that the Beatles deserve so much credit for, it's the way they brought black music to the public's attention. And in 1964, you know, I mean, everybody knows that the pop music world before the Beatles was basically you know, white artists for the most part. There was very little... R&B really did not stand out as much. I mean, you had people like... Uh, you did have Elvis, but you also had, you know... I mean, all the... Uh, you know, all the white artists... Um, on my brain... I know I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, some of the white artists. I mean, you had everybody... Uh, a Bobby Bobby Darren, Bobby V, the, you know, all those guys. Pat Boone, you know... Um, I mean, there was some, you know, Fats Domino was around, but I mean, you had guys like Pat Boone covering, uh, you know, Ain't That a Shame. But the Beatles really, really brought that to the forefront with the, you know, by doing Chuck Berry and Little Richard. But it's interesting that there have been opinions, and one of them was um, by author Elijah Wald that they pushed black music aside which I really I think that's garbage I I don't believe that at all and they're, um, because they not only did they credit black music I mean they played with some of these guys they played with Little Richard they you know they um, they love this stuff so it's crazy uh, to, to even suggest that they had such respect for the music and they brought it all to our attention but beyond the people they actually covered there's a ton of influences and i think some of you, some of you listening probably know about the fan collection called dustbin prophecies 24 discs uh of music that not only they covered but kind of that reached out and from their music to be influenced and it, it's 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 a, an incredible collection if you can find it because the it's, it, the the artists 
go all the way back to big bands and everything like that. It's it's crazy, but they really there was really a lot of their influences in in that kind of music was amazing. That's that's really all all I can say. I mean, I you know specifically you can talk about blues, you can talk about boogie woogie, you can talk. I mean, there's so many influences that they had. And they and thankfully they brought a lot of that to everybody's attention, one way or the other, either directly through the covers they did, or through scholars looking into their music and finding you know that there were all these influences. So, you know, if there's one thing that they really should get credit for that we we should thank them for, it's it's that. I, I think part of the 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 problem that uh, at least here in America was that this country in the 50s was still, and unfortunately, this is a, within my lifetime, uh, was still so shamefully segregated that the, the, a lot of the early black rock artists like Chuck Berry, like Little Richard, uh, like Fats Domino, really had a tough time getting, uh, getting exposure, certainly you know, uh, certainly on radio, other than R and B stations, nobody would play them. Uh, if anything, they would play the white covers by Pat Boone of mm-hmm. Little, of Little Richard's hits. And uh, in England, that kind of prejudice really didn't exist to it certainly to the extent that it did that it did, that it did here. So the people in England were much more open. To the music of of black artists uh, of in all of those those musical genres that you just mentioned, Steve. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, not just R and B, but boogie woogie and big bands, et cetera, et cetera. One of the mm-hmm. when you're talking about you know disc jockeys playing R and B, one of the uh, that brings up the uh, you know the fact that Dewey Phillips, who played the uh, you know, who was one of the DJs, uh, he's actually credited with playing the first Elvis record, but I mean, he he was right. basically an R&B DJ. Right. And there are air checks of, of him around. I actually found a CD of his, one of his air checks years ago. But yeah, I mean, guys like like that who, you know, and there were a lot of other examples, but, but Dewey Phillips comes to mind because of, you know, he, he was basically R&B, but he played Elvis because Elvis was so R&B influenced, you know, but um, I mean, yeah, that's kind of, it's kind of crazy. It's really, that's the way America, America was back then. It really was, you know, white music really mattered more, you know, until, and then the Beatles kind of brought it, brought the awareness around. Thank goodness. Hmm. Can I just add something on this? Because, you know, I'm agreeing with everything that you're saying here, but as someone who's always been a chart buff, right. You know, Fats Domino and Chuck Berry had a lot of hits on the pop charts. Mm-hmm. And yes, I know there are countless examples you can come up with where um, there are songs that were great songs done by R&B acts that were covered by white artists who got more airplay, like uh, Shaboom, right. <laughs> for example, uh, you know, back then. Yes. But there, there were a few examples of black artists that still got airplay on, on pop radio. I mean, Fats Domino did get airplay, and as did uh, Chuck Berry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm looking at at uh, Fats's chart history, and um, oh yeah, he definitely he definitely had some top ten records um, in the '50s. But in the '60s, everything was everything was um, outside the top ten. And in in I mean, in '64, in '64, Fats Domino had three chart records or four chart records and the and the highest one in 64 was number 63 and it's probably a song mm-hmm. that if i mention the title you'll kind of go what because i don't because it was who cares which i don't even remember hearing and then of course in 68 he charted with um lady with this cover of lady madonna but yeah. even that didn't didn't do very well so um that uh, didn't get higher than number 100 according to um, this billboard book I have. So it's funny since it was almost one hundred percent a rip off and or slash tribute to his style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. And but. you still had you still had artists in the late fifties and early sixties like um 
like uh, Sam Cooke or uh, Brooke Benton, you know, uh, people like those that still manage to have some presence on the pop charts. Mm-hmm. Actually, Sam Cooke did very well. Right. But, uh, you know, it, it's not like black artists were totally ignored. Oh, no, they weren't, they weren't being ignored. I mean, they did have success. I mean, after all, like, you know, for instance, Nat King Cole, was one of the most respected pop singers in in the world at that point in time. And yet, when he was given an NBC television series in nineteen in the nineteen fifty six fifty seven season, it ended up being canceled because of the fact that so many NBC affiliates in the South wouldn't carry it because of the mm. fact that he was black. Mm. But right. see, this is the, the and you know when uh, when Bo Diddley appeared on the Sul- on the Ed Sullivan Show uh, late in 1955, uh, the the uh, the reaction was was awful. You know the you know Sullivan's core audience was you know just appalled. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and it was quite some time before there were any before there was another black. R and B or rock and roll artist on the Sullivan Show, you know. Mm-hmm. That's uh, but that's unfortunately that's the way it was. I mean, yeah, you know, yes, you know, Chuck Berry and and a few of the other, uh, well, well, actually less so with Chuck Berry, but cert- uh, probably Fats. I think Fats was probably the most successful in terms of chart hits at that mm-hmm. at that point, but still. I think what happened was that the that a lot of the the R and B core R and B artists were kind of restricted to R and B radio stations and all. And the point is that in England, that kind of prejudice really didn't. Uh, part- well, you know, yes and no. I mean, yeah. I think we're giving the Brits a little too much credit here. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> If you keep in mind that you know we're we're what we're criticizing about the U.S. was also largely the case in England. I mean, officially, on the radio stations, we're not playing a lot of black music either. Um, what we were find, what was happening in England that is notable for us and is different is that kids especially kids who were forming bands like the Beatles and the Stones and the Animals and you know all these others were getting R&B records from American sailors and you know in the port right. cities these things were coming mm-hmm. over and they were fascinated with it and they were playing it sure. and their audiences were loving it but i mean keep in mind that when the Beatles then an unsigned group played Please Mr. Postman for the first time on the BBC. That was the first Tamla Motown song the Beatles that the, the BBC ever played. That's right. So they're, they're, it, yeah. you know, they weren't really doing much better than American radio stations, I don't think. Um, and possibly they were doing worse, you know. But Well, uh, definitely worse because especially <laughs> since in those days, you know, there really was no – top 40 radio as such in England there were things right. like there were there was stuff like you know Radio Luxembourg right and then a little bit later on the uh, you know the the pirate radio stations Radio Caroline and Radio London mm-hmm. and such yeah. uh, but but yeah there was no you know there was no top 40 radio in England in the way that that there was you know in America yeah. In, in in around 64, 65, the Stones managed to convince one of the British TV shows, I think Shendig, but it may have been one of the others, um, to put either, again, I'm forgetting, it was either Howlin' Wolf or Mud- Muddy Waters, I think Howlin' Wolf, uh-huh. um, to feature him prominently in a show in which they were also performing, and they introduced him, and you know, it was sort of incredible having this, you know, old, who was already sort of aged black guys. I think mm. it was Wolf. No. So um, the show that that appearance pretty much doomed that TV show. I mean, the the BBC was not happy with it, and it basically got the show more or less kicked off the the airwaves, and the producers of it ended up putting together a new show to do something else and, and get pop music back on. But, um, it, it was, it was shindig Alan. Yeah. It was. So, yeah. And, um, 
And I've seen some of that. Well, actually, we've all seen some of that clip because it was included in the uh, CNN history of the 60s. Uh Uh, I've seen a little more of it than was in there. And, you know, it's an incredible performance. I mean, this is now a fantastic historical document, and it was not appreciated by the powers that be at the time. But, you know, and yet, you know, one of the things that that you guys were saying as well is that the Beatles were able to go on to British radio and on their records and in their concerts and and particularly, you know, before they became famous in the ballrooms and and dances they were playing and really make this music pretty popular. And obviously the same with the Stones and the Animals and all those groups that were the Yardbirds that were sort of really into the blues and and uh american black american singers and and writers and they ultimately came and sold it back to us because they had a better command of the original recordings than an awful lot of the sort of basic white teenage audience in the united states which was Hmm. kind of surprised, you know, uh, to learn these songs and then when looking into them, find out that they were Motown things. And and they were always campaigning for it. I mean, there's that Shindig, no, sorry, Ready, Steady, Go performance Mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, they interview them about what what movies they're watching, what they're listening to. And they ask George, you know, who do you listen to at home? And he says, well, you know, the Tamla Motown artists, all that crowd, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so they were doing. I, I mean, to to say that the Beatles sort of pushed black music out is is is, is really, in a way, it's kind of outrageous. I mean, I I guess what he's trying to say is they became so popular that it became another white group that was sort of sucking all the air out of the room. But I mean, what can you say? I mean, in in terms of bringing the the music that was their roots to back to the American audience, I don't think they can be faulted or to the British audience. Now, mm. as our, our our resident musicologist, obviously, you know, everybody knows that the that groups like the Stones and the and the Who and uh and the Kinks, their uh and the animals, their kind of their musical roots especially the groups from the southern end of England that their that their black musical roots were more in the blues area mm-hmm. uh give us an idea of of the kind of black music that the beatles were listening to and were and were performing especially in their in their formative years um well you know i mean all all the stuff that we know from the bbc recordings and the hamburg mm-hmm. recordings and um and and undoubtedly there were others too but i mean they they shared with the stones a fascination for chuck berry right um the stones were a little more into the sort of purist blues thing uh than than the beatles were um but chuck berry was a kind of middle ground on which they could sort of meet Obviously, the you know one of the things the Beatles were really into is, as you know, were girl groups, and right. you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of their early cover repertory was songs made popular by girl groups, and a lot of those groups were black. Uh-huh. Um, you know, the Marvelettes and the Cookies, and you know, um, the Shirelles. Yeah, Shirelles. Yeah. And I mean, you know, as, as Mark Lewison points out, I mean, you have this this sort of interesting confluence of basically, in a lot of cases, white Jewish songwriters writing for black groups being taken up by these young British boys. So um, it's it's kind of it's kind of a little rainbow coalition there. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we 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 know a lot of we can, we can see their influences in um, you know Lady Madonna as we talked about um, shows it, and uh, they're playing a lot of you know Little Richard and Fats Domino and uh, other things in their in their sets, and even you know if you look at McCartney's solo career and George's to some extent too. A little less John, because John, with the exception of the rock and roll album, really did almost entirely originals. Um, And he tended not to collaborate with people or at least people on his level. I mean, he collaborated with Elephant's Memory. But, you know, you look at Paul and you see when he did his rock, his Russian album, um, there are things like Don't Get Around Much Anymore, which was Ellington. And, you know, Mm -hmm. goes back farther earlier than the, the rock era. But... 
those are the influences that are in there. And uh, and then you look at the people he collaborated with. I mean, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, more recently Kanye and uh, and Rihanna. I think there's there's sort of always been a, a a fascination there. I guess in John's case, the exception would be King Curtis played uh, played sax on. Um, I don't want to be a soldier. Um, Was it? It's, right. and it's so hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, you know, other than that, he, he didn't collaborate that much and he didn't cover that much. I mean, obviously the oldies album, the rock album. But uh, and of course, he's, the rock and roll album sort of came about because he sort of lifted material from Chuck Berry. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you know, Ringo is also a little different. You know, Ringo, when his his cover things tend to be more country western and and that kind of thing but uh but i you know i think they really all shared a a, a passion for sort of soul r&b blues kind of uh you know those things that were being imported into england and and had a certain exotic quality to english kids because the pop that they were hearing officially was a lot more bland than that stuff it gave it an exciting element. And also the fact that, you know, the, the black music um, and especially the sort of jazz blues influenced had a lot of, you know, sexual innuendo and that kind of thing. And for, sure. you know, young guys collecting records and starting bands, that, that's, that's kind of a cool thing that they're not hearing on the radio, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was all of that stuff swirling around. Absolutely. Now you mentioned, you know, you mentioned John Lennon, and I think Ken can probably speak to this. There are um, in the not so much in his solo career, but certainly in the early Beatle years, there mm-hmm. are there are two particular artists that uh, that John particularly kind of latched onto and, um, uh, and, and brought into the, uh, in, into the Beatle, uh, the, in, into their recording catalog. And that's Larry Williams mm. and Arthur Alexander. Right. Yeah. Well, that's one of the many great things about the Beatles and some of these other British, uh, bands is that they didn't just, uh, cover the most well-known artists of the 50s. Right. They also covered other black artists that were lesser known. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and that also went into their solo careers, too. I mean, uh, Paul McCartney covered She Said Yeah, which is a Larry Williams song. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's very true. But um, the thing about the Beatles is, and I think what separates them from so many other bands, is that they really were so musically eclectic and they had so many different influences and black artists were a big part of it. There's no doubt about it. You know, you can talk about all the different cover versions that they've done from black artists, but it goes further than that. I mean, we were just mentioning Lady Madonna and in that particular case, Paul's trying to sing like Fats Domino, who coincidentally covered Lady Madonna right after the Beatles recorded it. (laughs) And also I'm thinking about a few examples when Paul has talked about writing songs that were in the style of Chuck Berry. In particular, Run, Devil, Run, he said, was very much in the Chuck Berry vein, as was Get Out of My Way. Sure. So I think, um, you know, when it becomes an influence on your original material, that shows an even more powerful influence. You know, and you can be influenced in a number of ways. It could be songwriting style. It could be, it could be vocally, the way that Paul was certainly influenced by Little Richard. So uh, in many ways, and... And there were black artists pre pre rock and roll that influenced the Beatles too. Sure. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. You know, I, I was mean, just um, uh, I'm about to do a, a special on uh, the songs that George covered in his solo career, and then I was reminded that James Ray, who originally did "Got My Mind Set on You," was a black artist. Right. <laughs> That's right. So, and we were just talking about the stereos yes. when we were, uh, you know, talking about the Gontrapa album. Right. And that was a black band right. out of Ohio, 1961. Right. So there are these lesser-known artists, and certainly James Ray is one of them. James Ray was really only known for one particular song called If You Gotta Make a Fool of Somebody, right. which uh, was a hit here, and Freddie and the Dreamers had a hit with it in the UK, and the Beatles used to perform the song live. That's right. But aside from that... Uh, you know, George just lifted this obscure album cut <laughs> from James Ray's album 
from 1963 when he came here in the States and made a big hit out of it 24 years after that album came out. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's all these different examples. You could talk about, um, for example, well, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, (laughs) which was first a hit for Cab Calloway. Right. And that goes all the way back to 1931 for that. So, um, you know, the Beatles' influences... It, it crosses over to lots of pre-rock and roll stuff, which you were only to find out about later with, you know, the, the uh, dance hall stuff that Paul was writing in particular. And then with, with Ringo doing Sentimental Journey and, you know, uh, those examples and Kisses on the Bottom. And um, they were influenced by everything. They were influenced by the music around them. We haven't mentioned Smokey Robinson yet. Oh, right? yeah. And yeah. Um, every time you think of with the Beatles... <laughs> You know, Smokey Robinson's name should always come up because not only did they cover You Really Got a Hold on Me, but uh, John said All I've Got to Do was was influenced by Smokey. And Paul said Not a Second Time was influenced by Smokey. Mm-hmm. And, of course, George wrote a couple songs in tribute to Smokey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there you go right there. So, um, you know, they're influenced by the, the current music around them and music of the past. And um, and later on in their solo careers, they worked with a lot of black artists and brought Billy Preston into Apple. Right, right. you know, they thought so hi- so highly of so. Right. Speaking of speaking of Billy Preston, there's a clip on YouTube that talking out to everyone listening. If you haven't seen it, of him and Nat King Cole when Billy is 11. Right. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in the WC Handy uh, bi- right. Uh, right. film bio. Yeah. Right. The individual clip is there though. Right on YouTube, um, and it's 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 that's amazing that that Billy was was with him at that age, um, but yeah, that's that's really cool too. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting since Ken mentioned uh, uh, Smokey Robinson that at a point where Motown had not really yet become Motown. Uh, mm-hmm. In in 1963, in the second half of 1963, the Beatles included three covers of recent Motown hits on their second album, which was, uh, you know, which is very, you know, very unusual, mm-hmm. you know. And mm-hmm. you know, plus you know, plus as you say, the influence of Smokey on "Not a Second Time," and uh, uh, and, and they also had the ability with some of the the black artists that they admired to basically take <clears throat> take what were really R and B songs and turn them into rock and roll. Right. For instance. Well, the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Twist and shout. Right. And uh, since that was done by the Ozzy Brothers, right. you should also mention that they did shout. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Right. But there are a couple of others. Uh, money. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, yeah, that's true. Uh, but also, <laughs> well, uh, okay. Well, 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 please, Mr. Postman. Right. Yeah, exactly. The the you know, the three Motown uh, Motown covers on the second album. But also, mm-hmm. like, for instance mentioned larry williams before if yeah. you if you listen to the originals of the three larry williams songs that the beatles covered they're all very r&b especially bad boy you know mm-hmm. it's it's it has it's almost unrecognizable in comparison to the you know to this total rocked out uh, rave up if you want to use uh, the you know that that phrase uh, that uh, that they recorded in, in 1965. It's uh, you know it's 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 almost a totally different animal, uh-huh. but they were able to kind of sort of breathe new life into those songs, or give them at least a new a new dimension. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's kind of well, interesting you know, with the Beatles because, I mean, it, it's – in a way, it's not as if they were in, intending to breathe new life into these things. It's that they were taking these songs that they really liked uh-huh. and trying to fit a completely different kind of instrumentation and style into what they had available. True. So a lot of these old records have saxes and yep. – you know, not to mention girls' voices and and everything, and it's uh, you know, and they're transforming it into 
boys' voices, guitars, bass, and they're you know they're really sort of putting their mark on it. But basically, as a almost as a kind of you know necessity, sort of like okay, we want to play this. How can we do it? Okay, we'll move the sax solo over into the guitar, and you know, and we'll we'll do those harmonies. We'll add new harmonies, things like that. And it, you know, they they really put their stamp on it. I have a question though for everyone. Yeah. You know, assuming that a lot of us and, and 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 I admit in my case it's it's true. I mean, I heard the Beatles versions of things like Roll Over Beethoven long before or, and uh, rock and roll music long before I heard Chuck Berry. When you caught up with the originals, did you find that, you know, given the kind of differences that Al just mentioned, did you find that in a in a way you ended up liking the originals more than the Beatles versions or not? Well, no. in my in, in my in my case in, in my case, I I have to say I probably did hear the Chuck Berry versions before the Beatles, but yeah, I agree with Ken. the uh, The answer is no. Um, I mean, partially because the you know the Beatles, especially in '64, were just so overwhelming culturally um, to everything. Um, it was hard not to. Uh, and even ra- and radio wasn't playing. They were they may have been playing Chuck Berry and you know and, and things like that back then, but they but the Beatles were getting played a lot more. So yeah, but forgetting about radio, you know, once you are getting these records yourself and listening to them, I mean, I know that in in some cases I felt like you know hmm, I, I actually think that the Chuck Berry versions of some of these things are a bit leaner and tighter, and you know, I, it's not like I dislike the Beatles versions after hearing Chuck Berry's versions and some of the others, but I I kind of in some ways felt that if I had to choose one or the other, I might choose the original. Well they're they're leaner and tighter, but they don't have that kind of rock anthemic quality that for instance the Beatles version of rock and roll music or roll over Beethoven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I like that. I like that. I like those big mm. words. Al. <laughs> well, I mean, just, basically, basically, they don't have John Paul George and Ringo on it. I think that's that's what it comes down to. Well, because, I mean, well, I mean, it's, uh, Chuck Berry is no slouch. I mean, let's face yeah. it. Yep. But uh, yeah. but but the you know just the you know the 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 arrangements and of course obviously there's there's more instrumentation on the Beatles versions. Because it really was just, you know, Chuck with uh, basically just with, uh, you know, p- uh, piano. Jack, Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson, yeah. Mm-hmm. But let's make it clear now. We're mm-hmm. not talking about now. We're talking about we're talking about then. I mean, there's a difference between then and now. Oh, sure. I think, I think people, I, 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 people, I think everyone appreciate, you know, has come to the you know realization that. The music, you know, a lot of that old music is fantastic. I know, I know, I just personally picked up um, a CD of the other night by the Golden Gate Quartet that is absolutely stunning. It's, um, I mean, the it's not rock and roll, but damn, it sure comes close to it. Mm. it you know, when they sing that go- that old gospel stuff. This is in, from the forties. It was, it's, it's fantastic, and and you know, I and I think, like I say, I think. We all appreciate that music a lot more now than we did. I mean, look at all the reissues that are coming out of that stuff now. I mean, and not just not, not just Chuck Berry. I mean, there's a lot of obscure reissues, and some of that stuff is getting nominated for you know Grammys for historical album for a good damn good reason because right. it's great. Right, but that's nothing new. That's been happening for decades. You know, I mean, I, I think the 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 uh, um, demand is a lot more now. Uh, a lot more. I mean, uh, you got the rest of you, Alan, uh, Ken, do you, you agree? I think there's much more respect for the 50s artists because what because of what the artists that followed did by bringing back their music to America. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all these years of hearing this stuff has made people want to investigate the original recordings. But to answer Alan's question, I don't think you can really give an across-the-board the answer for that. I think you have to pick apart each artist because Chuck Berry I love Chuck Berry and there's nothing like hearing Chuck Berry's recordings with him doing the guitar solo Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean he's a great guitar solo and 
it's more in its pure form that way. Mm -hmm. But the Beatles had so much energy on their own records. And also, if you're a big fan of harmonies, as I am, and you've got two or three part harmonies on Beatle records that you you wouldn't have had on a Chuck Berry record or uh, or any, or some of the other artists from the fifties, then you're going to favor that. On the other hand, you know, Little Richard stuff from the fifties, it just has got so much energy. Oh yeah, you know. Oh, God. You know, he, he's belting it out right there. So those recordings, you know, they're kind of tough to top. But then <laughs> the Beatles recording of Long Tall Sally is one of the most amazing of their rockers. Yeah. I will say that um, when it comes to something like the Coasters, I like the Coasters recordings better. Mm. You know, really? uh, the Coasters yeah. recording of Say Searchin' is fantastic, much better than what the Beatles did on Decca, sure. in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you're a, a big fan of really rich vocals from black artists, sometimes it's hard to top that. Sure. If you're talking about um, uh, John doing uh, Bring It On Home To Me, or Paul for that matter, compared to Sam Cooke, you know, it's very hard <laughs> to compare the two if you love that voice of Sam Cooke. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's all, it's so, it's apples and oranges there. I mean, I, I love the Beatles for what they brought to those recordings as a group, and I love the the cover versions from the solo careers and uh you know john and paul to me are two of the greatest vocalists so it's hard to top them but you know i really appreciate a lot of the the singers that have really rich voices like like a sam cook for that example mm -hmm. and i just wanted to mention very briefly because i i said earlier in the show that there were black artists that got airplay al uh -huh. um and i was just thinking about it and and we completely forgot about these artists but what about the drifters and what about the platters? Oh, you know, I mean, those, they had huge hits in the 50s and early 60s. So I, I'm sure that there was a, a, a huge problem for a lot of black artists to get airplay on, on white radio, primarily white radio. Yes. But there were, you know, quite a lot, quite a lot of black artists there that did have, and I didn't even mention Chubby Checker. You know, The Twist was one of the biggest oh, yeah. records of all time. So, you know, there were uh, a decent amount of black artists that did get a lot of airplay from, uh, you know, the mid fifties from whenever they say rock and roll started rock around the clock on. Although most people, a lot of people think that rock and roll started in the late forties and early fifties. Right. But, um, you know, there were, there were a decent amount of black artists that still got airplay on top 40 radio. Oh, sure. Especially as top 40 radio grew, uh, in the late 50s and into the early 60s. But those artists, other than the, the platters, actually used to get airplay on what, with what was known as good, quote unquote, good music stations like, say, the old WNAW AM in New York, uh, mm. uh, because of the fact that there that the sound of Twilight Time and Only You was a little more was a little bit more pop than than that of you know the other than say Fats Domino or Little Richard or Chuck Berry, mm. and and also there's there's uh, there's an artist there are a couple of artists that the Beatles expressed a great admiration for but actually never recorded anything uh by any of them by either of them uh um either for their you know their EMI catalog or for the BBC uh one is Ray Charles who was one mm. of their major influences i know people are going to say oh, wait a minute i got a woman the version of I Got a Woman that they did for the BBC is Elvis's version. Okay. But Ray Charles was a huge influence uh, on, on the Beatles, as was, uh, as was Chuck Jackson, who was, yeah. who was a, um, you know, a big kind of up, what you might call uptown R&B star of the early and mid-60s. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. I, do, I remember Ringo mentioning Chuck yes. Jackson. When he was uh, injured. In fact, he did cover Chuck Jackson. Did he? He covered I Keep Forgetting mm. uh, on the Old Wave album. Oh, that's right. Mm. And and Paul did cover Ray Charles because he did Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying. Yes, you're right. right. Which was on uh, Trippin' Live Fantastic as part and of he, his uh, sound checks. Right. And, and we don't have a recording of it, but the, 
but the Beatles as a group apparently had a rave up version of what I say in uh-huh. their Hamburg days. So. Mm-hmm. They certainly did there's, there's, something. It's, it's pity there's no recording of that because the descriptions yeah. are are so out there. Mm-hmm. there there's a, right. If, if you're really interested in looking at um, what constituted rock and roll, there's a great uh, three CD set. I believe it's out of England. It's called the first rock and roll record that goes mm-hmm. all the way back to gospel, and it has it has some incredible, including. Benny Goodman and Gene Krupa doing "Sing, Sing, Sing," which is one of my favorite tracks ever. But I mean, all these, all these, you know, tracks that you could connect to rock and roll. It's kind of like that that big set of, of the the Beatles, uh, the Beatles thing that I mentioned earlier. But I mean, that you know, there's so much of a connection between older music and current rock and roll. It's, it's crazy, and this particular set is well worth looking for. It's really a great set. Yeah. I wanted to add a couple of things. Please. You mentioned girl groups before. Mm-hmm. And I think girl groups are really important in telling the story of the Beatles and in their recordings mm-hmm. because not just because they covered girl groups, but they were influenced by the song structure of songs from girl groups, in particular all the call and answer stuff that were on uh girl group songs. Mm-hmm. Like they covered boys and you know, you can hear the call and answer in that. Sure. Well, I talk about boys. Yeah, yeah, boys. Don't you know these boys? Yeah, yeah, boys. Well, they did the same thing in their own songs. Like, uh, Tell Me Why. You know, they would, John would sing a line, the others would sing something back. Uh, they would do that in You're Gonna Lose That Girl. You know, You're Gonna Lose That Girl? Yes, yes, You're Gonna Lose That Girl. You know, it went back and forth like that. So I think that was a huge influence on some of their songs. Mm-hmm. And in addition to that, there is one person that we should mention who influenced Paul McCartney tremendously. And he's not a singer. And that's James Jamerson. Yes. Oh, right. You know, that's right. Paul always likes to cite him as being, you know, one of the biggest influences on him as a bass player. And, you know, he would refer to him as the Motown guy. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're an expert on bass playing and you listen and you isolate Paul's bass playing in the Beatles in particular, or maybe some of his solo stuff, you, you will probably hear the influence there if you know James Jamerson's playing in Mo, on Motown records. Mm-hmm. Another thing, actually, that that brings to mind, that you're mentioning of James Jamerson, is um, that the Beatles wanted their recorded sound to be like the Motown sound to a degree. I mean, when they went into EMI to complain about not having a mu- enough bass and drums and, and lower end, mm. they would bring in those records and say, we want to sound like this, you know? So even just the sort of sound concept of those Motown things is something that influenced them. In, in mm-hmm. 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 The, plus that tantalizing a tidbit that came out within the last uh, year or two that they were actually contemplating recording at the Stack Studios mm-hmm. in 1966, right. but that the you know the 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 logistics and and also the 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 uh, the money that um, uh, that would have been involved uh, just you know made it prohibitive. But you could tell that you know that they were already becoming fans of the uh, um, of the you know the the Stax Volt sound. You know Otis Redding, Booker T and the MGs, the Marquis, Carla Thomas. Those records, which uh, which also are uh, uh, you know you can you can tell were were big influences. Well, in Booker T and the MGs, they lifted. Green onions, pretty directly for the yes, um, oddly named given what it is, so called <laughs> uh, uh, twelve bar original. The twelve bar part's true. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, yeah. I mean, there's the, the influences are just about everywhere, and once you start looking for the the black influences of the Beatles, you, I mean, you can just go on and on. I mean, we've mm-hmm. we've talked about songs they've covered. We've talked about the sound they wanted. We've talked about basis that that paul was inspired by i mean it, it really is very pervasive mm-hmm. they're really obscure people that they that they pulled out you know like the donays and yeah. you know i mean there were there were just some amazing uh 
you know, acts that they that uh, they pulled out of nowhere that uh, we probably would never heard. And of course, uh, uh, you know, Arthur Alexander, who they did such a great job with, um, you know, his his stuff. Yeah, and Little Willie John. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I mean Arthur Alexander is almost a, a foot a musical footnote here in America, but in England he was he was absolutely revered. And uh, you know, not only the Beatles, but the the Stones also recorded You Better uh, Move On. You better yeah. move on. Yeah. And and in fact right. yeah. in fact if I recall Cliff Richard also recorded that. So you know, so his his influence in England, of course, it didn't <laughs> didn't do him a whole lot of good because, uh, unfortunately, um, you know his uh, his career path was was not all that successful, and his and his personal life uh, was you know not not all that successful either. But uh, but nonetheless, he was uh, he was a very big influence uh, on the Beatles and the other uh, and the other British groups. Um, mm-hmm. And Larry Williams, in fact, had a similar uh, had a had a similar fate. As a matter of fact, uh, in fact, uh, I think Ken mentioned one of the um, R and B covers that Ringo had done. But he uh, he also did uh, Lipstick Traces. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah, well, that was that was um, a hit for the OJ's, right? Um, back in the mid '60s. Yep. So that's true. Yeah, you know, I was just going to say because you're mentioning both uh, Larry Williams and Arthur Alexander. For whatever the reason, "Bad Boy" is my favorite of all the Beatle covers. I just think it's the quintessential archetypal <laughs> uh, rock and roll song. I mean, in in yeah. two two minutes twenty seconds, it's all it's all about you know a teenager who loves rock and roll and doesn't want to go to school and all that, and just. John's vocals, I mean, everything about that song is so perfect. And the the great delivery, the R&B delivery that John delivers on Anna, that's one of my absolute favorite Beatle covers, too. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. You know, you can go on and on. I mean, Drowning in the Sea of Love right. was a song that uh, Ringo covered that was a hit for Joe Simon, another black artist. That was uh, 1971, I think, Joe Simon had a hit with that. Um, I was just reminded when we brought up Ray Charles... That I know that um, Paul McCartney has said that when he wrote The Long and Winding Road, he had Ray Charles in mind for it. Mm-hmm. And um, I believe George Harrison also said when he wrote something that he was thinking about Ray Charles for that song. So sometimes influences can show its head in, a, in another way. Sure. You know, <laughs> you might be thinking of another singer envisioning that person doing it and maybe giving the song to that person. So, you know, influences. Influences can, uh, you know, be shown in a number of ways, whether it's just covering the songs, whether uh, the artist influences uh, another artist in terms of songwriting style, vocally. So it's a good thing that we're, we're covering every aspect of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and, and Paul McCartney, in his, in his solo career, had huge hits <laughs> with a pair of duets. With two of the you know major since we mentioned Motown, uh, two of their uh, two of their major stars, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, Ebony and Ivory was the biggest charting single in Paul's solo career in the U.S. Mm-hmm. It was number one for seven weeks, and Say 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 ranks number two with six weeks and number one. So um, it just goes to show, you know, Paul will only work with people that he admires, right? The only thing is that, you know, I can't see Michael Jackson having been an influence on him. No. You know, it's just that, or you Kanye. know, he really liked this. Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Stevie Wonder, I mean, Paul has nothing but the greatest admiration right. for Stevie Wonder. There's no one on this planet I wish Paul would work with more than Stevie Wonder. But still, I don't know if I can think of an example where I'd hear Stevie Wonder's influence in Paul's music. So, uh it, it just goes to show that these are all people that Paul really uh, admires and, and wanted to work with. Yeah. The Beatles only work with people that they want to work with. So just the fact that they're doing it is a statement. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Uh, I'm trying to think if I'm missing any, uh, any other examples of their, uh, 
of the you know their the the the, the influence of black music uh, on the Beatles. I guess we well, we should mention uh, you know we we obviously have mentioned a lot about Chuck Berry and influence on the group and on John in particular. Yes. um, Just simply, it may be gilding the lily, but just to mention his appearance on the Mike Douglas show with Chuck Berry. Yes. And his introduction Mm -hmm. of Chuck Berry as as being basically rock and roll. Right. So, you know, and I had heard, I've been trying to think of where I heard this, and I, I remember it, being a, a source that was, you know, struck me as legitimate, um, but I can't remember exactly where it was. But um, I've heard that there was talk during the get back sessions of actually inviting Billy Preston to join the group as a member. They they actually did discuss that for a while. I mean, they had plenty of problems of their own, and there was mm-hmm. it wasn't clear that they were going to be going on much themselves. But but it it, it apparently was a, a topic that was discussed and. That would have been really sort of interesting, you know. You yeah, know, you know, I, I, I think you're right. I think I, ha- I think I have heard something to that effect. Although the fact that he was around so much, I mean, people may have also, you know, taken that to mean that they were going to ask him to join. But yeah, I, 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 it seems to me I recall that too a little bit. Somebody else that we didn't mention, um, or I don't recall anybody mentioning, was. Uh, Big Mama Thornton, because John did Hound Dog, and uh, mm. and that would have been, you know, uh, that song because it was such a a big um, thing for Elvis. It would have also been a big thing for would have meant a lot for John too. So, um, oh sure, yeah, sure, mm. absolutely. Well, you know, just by the very nature of the fact that the the Beatles loved Elvis. I mean, Elvis drew from all the R&B artists. Exactly. Right. So if you want to call it secondhand, I don't know if that's an appropriate term, but, you know, it all seeps its way in, mm-hmm. in, some, in some form or another. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and we didn't even mention Rosie in the originals. <laughs> <laughs> and John, John loved that song. Yeah, he, he really did. loved that song. He did. He absolutely did. No, kid, no question about that. Didn't and I also get... recall, you know, early on when the Beatles were, were interviewed about who they were listening to, like we were saying before, they also mentioned, you know, we're talking about Motown artists, they mentioned Mary Wells yes. quite yeah. often, mm-hmm. um, and they also mentioned Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Oh, Marvin Gaye, absolutely. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were big fans of Marvin Gaye. Which reminds me that Paul <laughs> uh, performed Hitchhike in the last That's couple of years. That's right. Mm-hmm. When he performed at the Apollo, yeah. you know, a right. very, very appropriate song to do yeah. there. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. I mean, there's so many there's so many songs you can mention. I mean, we could sit here and, and, and you know, and poke single songs and say, you know, they did this, this, and this. But, I mean, they, the, the big story is that, you know, that they... I don't know if you could use the word educated, but I but I'm tempted to say they really educated the especially the American audiences about their musical legacy, about you know about uh, the black artists, and um, you know it was really their their influence in the '60s that really helped bring that about. Because there really isn't another group, even the Stones with the doing the you know doing all the blue stuff they did, didn't do what. The Beatles did to Chuck Berry, to Fats mm-hmm. Domino, to Richard. It just didn't. It really didn't happen. And, and of course, introducing them to, you know, to like I said, the Donays and and you know, Isley Brothers. All the though the Isleys, I think, were were known. But Arthur Alexander would be another example of that. Sure. Um, you know, they you if you look at it from that point of view, and Larry Williams, you know, they really it was them. It was their influence. It was their power. If you want to use the word power, yeah, that that really made that made that all happen. That's that's a great point because I know as as a fan myself back there in 1964, when I would see or hear interviews with them, and they would mention some of these acts that they were that they admired, 
I mm-hmm. then, in you know, in a few cases, would then go out and try to find out more about those particular artists. I mean, Ray Charles, we kind of knew about, and Chuck Berry, we knew about, but uh, but you know, as a fourteen year old, I didn't really know much about. Now he wasn't a black artist, but Buddy Holly, you know. Right. I mean, I knew you know, I knew a couple of songs, and I knew he had died in a plane crash. That was about it. Mm-hmm. And 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 even and even Elvis, uh, to mm-hmm. some extent. So I know I know in the summer of '64, I went out and got uh, the that first Elvis's Gold Records album mm-hmm. uh, that RCA had put out in 1957, and one of those Buddy Holly Greatest Hits collections, and you know began really learning about their music and it was the same with with a lot of the r&b uh, acts as well do you ever go to the uh any of the murray the k shows no no because they were at the uh the brooklyn uh, the brooklyn fox and mm-hmm. being in new jersey brooklyn was like uh <laughs> you know it may as well have been in uh jabib uh <laughs> <laughs> was, I never, I never did either. Uh, I wish I had because there, yeah. were, uh, I mean, it was a great mixture of, uh, of, of you know, of everything. Uh, yes. I mean, he had all sorts of, he had everything. Uh, you know, and if you look at the history of those those sto- shows, and unfortunately, I never did get to go. I mean, the, the great part about AM radio in the New York area. Is that they played all that stuff? I mean, between WMCA and WABC and WINS, you know, they played all that stuff. Um, there was they, uh, a lot of musical. I forget what the, uh, the the word that I normally use, but there was a, a lot of musical democracy. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, um, so we were able to hear a wide variety of music, and certainly R and B. You know, especially Motown and some of the uptown R and B certainly made its way into the the top forty playlists. Plus the fact that there were the black stations like, well, in New York, W uh, WWRL, and uh, and and a couple of others that uh, that played, you know, that played almost exclusively R and B. Mm-hmm. You know, so we were we were definitely exposed to to that you know to that music to a great extent. Mm. You know, so it was you know so it was it was actually very easy to to kind of become a, a kind of a musical sponge and be able to absorb all of these different all of these different musical influences, and certainly uh, and certainly the Beatles helped. A great deal in that uh, in that process. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I just remembered one other cover yeah. of of a song that was a huge hit for a black group, and uh, that's "Where Did Our Love Go." Oh, sure. Ringo covered the Supreme set. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. That's true because the Supremes were um, they were probably the most the most successful in terms of chart hits probably the most successful american group of what you would call the you know the beatle era you know mm-hmm. the fact that they had five straight number one songs right in the, the in the right in the midst of the first the first blush of beatlemania and the british invasion uh from uh, the summer of 64 to the summer of '65, had they had yeah. five straight number one records. Then had one nothing but heartaches that didn't make number one. And then the next one, I hear a symphony, made it six out of um, six out of seven. Yeah, they had, they had twelve number ones yeah. in the '60s. Right. Very, very impressive. Very impressive From... given the competition of that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really. Absolutely. Well, this has been a, this has been a very interesting discussion, and um, uh, I think we need to uh, let you know about how you can uh, how you can contact us, and also Ken has Ken has a contest connected with uh, his uh, with his website and with every little thing, and he's going to tell us about it now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I have something called a special contest, which I do in addition to my weekly trivia. And um, by the time the show gets posted, there'll still be a few days before this will start. But I'm going to do something which I've never done before. And named after Paul McCartney's song from Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, it's called a Friends to Go Uh, special contest. So what this means is I'm giving away five CDs all at once from people who have worked with the Beatles or have been friends with the Beatles. And to let you know what they are, Lawrence Juber, his most recent CD called Fingerboard Road. We had Lawrence on our show, was a great guest. Um, Also, Gary Van Syok, the bass player from Elephant's Memory, recently put out his very first CD called Pop Goes the Elephant. Also, Billy J. Kramer who uh, not too long ago put out a CD called I Won the Fight with a lot of original material from Billy. Mm -hmm. Um, Mark Rivera, good friend of ours, who uh, released a CD called Common Bond, and we all know him from being the musical director for Ringo and the All-Stars more than anybody else, and also 30-plus years with Billy Joel, and that album is just tremendous. And then there's Jeff Slate and his band called Birds of Paradox, which happens to have two members of Elephant's Memory, Gary Van Syok and, and Adam Ippolito, and two members of Wings, Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly. <laughs> so you can win all five of those CDs in this special contest called Friends to Go. And to find out how, just visit my website. All the details will be on my homepage at kenmichaelsradio.com. Okay. Uh, and you have to know the song Friends to Go, frontwards and backwards. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what and what it's about <laughs> Steve uh, why don't you give us our uh, our contact information if you want to write to us by email it's things we said today radio show at gmail.com or we're on twitter at things we said fab and you can you can get a hold of us uh, there and we also have facebook pages uh, two of them, one for the group, one for the show, one for the one for a group for the show. Actually, though, the, I think the best way, if you want to send us some cr- uh, comments or criticism or whatever, is the uh, Gmail address. Um, but uh, and who knows, we may make you famous uh, by uh, responding to the, to it on the on the show here one of these days. Mm-hmm. So, or infamous, or inf- infamous. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, we're the ones that are infamous uh, <laughs> because of you know some of these discussions, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good George Harrison song. There. Right. <laughs> and Alan, anything anything you uh, need to promote? Uh, no, not really. Apart from maybe just to say that um, I've made my uh, very belated return to Beatle fan lately with a yes. piece uh, about the. The one release is a, a lot of the things I say in that piece we've discussed here as well. So, um, but it's been a while since I've written for them, and um, you know now I have the time. So, yeah. uh, uh, it's fun to do. And uh, you know, I, I I love when editors don't complain about how long you write. You know, yeah. this, this is like three full pages of Beatles fan. So, um, <laughs> and I just thought I'd point that out. That's true. the uh, the new Ooh. the new issue is kind of split down the middle between coverage of the one one plus packages and the fiftieth anniversary of the release of Rubber Soul. Mm-hmm. Great issue mm. as always. And otherwise, if you want to get in touch with me, um, you know the the address that, that Steve gave uh, for the show, and I've got a Facebook page. Under my name, Alan Cozen, and my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. Write to me there, and uh, and I'll respond if there's something pertinent to say. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you can contact me, speaking of Beetle Fan, through, through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com, uh, or Parading Press, uh, www paradingpress.com for changing times 101 days that shaped the generation or uh, or just simply at uh, on Facebook at Al Sussman or on Twitter at ASUSS49 let me mention my email address yeah, it's uh, beetlesexaminer at gmail.com and I'm also on Facebook under my name and I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary where you're welcome to where I post stuff and you're welcome to talk about whatever you wish. So okay. there you go. Sounds good. 
And uh, this, yeah, this has been a very, uh, very quick hour. And uh, thanks, uh, thanks for tuning in. And for Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, this is Al Sussman, and we will see you next time.